Hello, uh, welcome to those of you who have joined. We, uh, we have over 400 registered for this webinar today, so we're going to wait uh, just a few more minutes, uh, maybe just a minute, uh, for uh, others to join. All right, it looks like the majority of people have joined now, uh, so we'll get started. Hello and welcome again. My name is John Sack, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm the founding director of Highwire. Before we uh, dive into the material, I'd like to put a focus, a tight focus on today's topic. We'll be looking at the implementation options, how it is that publishers could deliver on Plan S compliance. We won't be talking about the wisdom or the policy or the un unintended or even intended consequences of Plan S. Those are important topics and many smart people are addressing those. A number of publishers that I work with are following these two threads, implementation and policy in parallel so they can inform their leadership, but also at the same time, lay out possible workflows. I also wanna note that I'd be delighted to consider questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can submit your questions using the questions box on the go to control panel. You can either do this anonymously or include your name. By the way, you, you may be an expert yourself. I've met many of, uh, in researching Plan S. And if you have an answer to a question uh, that you hear uh, or a comment on something I mentioned, please send it along. I, I'd love it if you'd cite a source for anything that uh, you're sure of. Uh, some of the implementation questions about Plan S really won't be answered or answerable until Coalition S responds with clarifications in their revised guidance. Hopefully you've all received a copy of the white paper on Monday having to, that, that essentially is the, the text for this webinar. But if you haven't, we've attached it as a resource so you can download it from the, the GoTo control panel. The white paper contains more detail than I'll be able to cover in the webinar. We have just under 30 minutes for today's webinar and this is what we're going to cover. Of course, we start with a method section. How did we figure out what options people were considering and which were of the most interest? We'll look at that list of options from the perspective of publishers soon after the initial guidance was issued in November. Then we'll drill down on each of the four options that were of most interest to the academic publishers who participated in a workshop we held at the end of January. Now let's look at the timeline for coming to this understanding. Highwire has a long history of conducting ethnographic interviews, but we've most always focused on researchers starting from our days inside Stanford. This time we turned the microphone on to publishers themselves. But of course, whose input was gathered has a lot to do with the outcomes. And, and so I do wanna spend a minute on uh, where we got input from. In October, I interviewed 22 people from 15 different publishing organizations, small and medium sized with one or two up to 50 journals. Most, but not all were high wire customers. All were nonprofit academic customers, uh, I'm sorry, academic publishers, learned societies, academic organizations, etc. Some were highly selective like Science and BMJ and others very selective or some very broad. Most already had one or more OA journals in their suite, uh, and there are many, many hybrid journals among the group. The disciplines were all uh, STEM, uh, but were not all biomedical. It turned out we learned that disciplines do matter, uh, even within STEM, uh, since in some disciplines, the direction of travel, as people uh, use the phrase, was said to point to OA, but we did find some disciplines where that's just not so. Then in mid-December, uh, this group of uh, 
publishers I interviewed voted on the options I summarized from their interviews so that they could figure that we and they could figure out which were most important to cover in our late January workshop. Then on January 29th, we held a workshop, everyone around a single large table, everyone participating. Uh, and uh, we did that to present and debate the options. Then the group voted again at the end of the workshop to see which options were of most interest to most publishers. I should comment that the right option for your organization might not be among the most popular options our group discussed in the workshop. Your specific situation might take you in a different direction from, from those popular options, especially if you have some unusual characteristics such as barriers to OA uh, or a very high or very low percentage of articles affected by Plan S. Here are the uh, 14 options that came out of the uh, initial interviews. They're presented in the order of publisher preference, least to most, uh, as of mid-December. You can see the score for each option at the bottom of the box. The higher the score, the more preferred the option. The description of the options is presented in the white paper, and I won't go into much detail about them uh, in the interest of time. But let me just say a sentence about uh, each of them. So the first is, should new publishers, I'm uh, sorry, should publishers field their own compliant repository rather than relying on other repositories that are already out there? The second, stay the course, is really business as usual, means no special changes to accommodate Plan S authors or policies. The third option, uh, the mirror option, uses the same editorial board to operate an OA only or Plan S only journal. Now, this option was specifically disallowed by the implementation group, but it had come up in our surveys prior to that. Next was flipping journals uh, and flips of long established impactful journals from subscriptions to open access are rare, but they have been done. Uh, and the, the main uh, debate around this was if you see that eventually this direction of travel is headed in this direction, uh, maybe you should start planning for it now. The menu uh, of publishing services uh, was a route to handling capped APCs, uh, offer a suite of services for additional fees. Uh, just as in previous decades, uh, uh, publishers had color figures uh, enabled by paying color charges. Transformative agreements, uh, this is a uh, route for journal compliance uh, in Plan S that's open to hybrid journals, uh, but the hybrid has a fixed term life. Preprints, uh, the question here was, could an author with publisher permission post a preprint of the final accepted manuscript and be uh, compliant, essentially using the preprint uh, server as a repository? Now on the second row, uh, transparent hybrid subscription pricing. Uh, there was a hope pre-implementation guidance that hybrids could be continued if they were transparent about how uh, OA, the, the portion of open access articles in uh, the journal affected subscription prices to avoid the, uh, the charge of double dipping. Uh, the second one on the bottom row, transfer to an OA journal. Uh, here, publishers could offer a Plan S author and OA venue. Uh, it, that is a, a different journal that they could uh, publish in via the transfer. Read and publish agreements. Uh, these agreements tie uh, cost to publish open access with the cost to subscribe. And certainly larger publishers are pursuing this, uh, but they're usually geographically focused. Deposit to an existing compliance server. Uh, is, uh, here, the question was, would green open access uh, be compliant? Uh, and uh, where would those articles go? And would some publishers actually want to uh, enable this service, that is, perform it as a service? Uh, publish ahead of print with final author accepted manuscripts. Uh, author accepted manuscripts are now being published open access on a journal site by several publishers. And the question was, is this a route to compliance? Transparent APC pricing. Uh, if there are harder soft caps that are going to come in on APCs, the thinking here is that the only way to get past those for very selective journals would be to demonstrate the appropriateness of, uh, of the APC. And then finally, uh, bottom right uh, was Green OA itself without an embargo and with CC BY uh, offering authors a path to compliance. So in the workshop, 
The top 11 of 14 options were presented by individuals who could speak to the pros and cons of, of, of their option, followed by discussion and then question development. And we were developing questions specifically uh, for feedback to Coalition S. At the end of the day's workshop, as I said, we ran a survey again that told us what options were now of interest to the most publishers. Now let's see what the top options were after our workshop, and then we're going to focus on those. This is in the same order as the previous slide, but now we've highlighted the top options post-workshop. On the bottom row are the, the three options that had the highest score uh, after the workshop. And uh, you can see that the scores now post-workshop are the bottom right of each box. The highest rank three post-workshop are were using green OA to comply. Second was, th that was the highest. Second was deposit to an existing uh, compliant server or repository. And the third was publish ahead of print uh, with the uh, final author accepted manuscript. I've also included one that wasn't in the top three, but it moved up seven places in the ranking. And that's the, on the top row, stay the course for now. In our latest survey, it had risen from the number 13 of 14 options to number six in order of preference. And we'll talk about why that, that might be. Before we dive in, I think it's really good to keep the implementation guidance uh, top level three paths summary in mind. A lot seems to uh, depend on how this is interpreted, but at least at the top level, it's, it's pretty clear. The summary is from the perspective of authors, uh, as you can see from the wording, but it does lay out paths to becoming a compliant journal on the left and on the right, most columns. The left is for OA journals. The right is for these, these term limited hybrids moving to flip to OA. And in the middle is the option for authors and potentially for publishers to deposit articles. So the middle path is an article compliance path for authors to publish anywhere that offers them the necessary options such as CC BY. Now, there is a question about uh, how do you know which repositories are authorized? And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go forward. I think a lot of confusion, maybe some that it's just mine, is in the difference between publishing compliant articles, which is in the middle of, of this uh, three options, and publishing in compliant journals, which is on the left or on the right. And of course, publishers care about uh, the, the difference between publishing in compliant journals and publishing compliant articles. The devil's in the details in, in uh, scholarship and in publishing, uh, and our group of workshop participants developed 27 questions needing clarification in the implementation guidance. And like about a thousand others, we submitted these questions into the, the feedback process. Now I want to uh, start drilling into each of these four options that I highlighted on a previous slide. The first three will be the, the top ranked options so that you can see uh, uh, how the discussion in our meeting, in our workshop, uh, uh, looked at each of these. So using Green OA to comply, uh, Green OA uh, is, is not specifically mentioned, at least I don't believe it is, uh, uh, in the implementation guidance. And that's because it's usually associated with an embargo period. But that's not uh, true in this case. Note here that the role of the publisher is to set the rules, presumably updating their Sherpa Romeo entry with the, with the information about what they allow. The role of the author in this option uh, is to actually make the deposit. The next uh, option changes this, though. Uh, and the, the, um, the publisher would specify not only that the author can use this option, but what it is that they uh, can deposit. Uh, and unlike normal, if you will, green OA, there has to be immediate free access, and it looks like it needs to uh, be CC by. Now, as happened with uh, the early days of PubMed Central, confusion might arise about which article version, who, when, where, and how to deposit. Uh, and we, we think that uh, they're probably, we're much smarter now. We've learned from PubMed Central about how to, uh, to avoid some of this, uh, but uh, probably some of it's uh, just going to happen. Uh, 
publishers would need to choose whether authors can deposit uh, author accepted manuscripts or the version of record. Uh, probably not a choice. You probably want to be clear about which it, uh, which it is. Uh, there's still debate uh, 20 years after the launch of PubMed Central about which is uh, best uh, from a publisher standpoint, uh, from the standpoint of the, of the science. And we need to ensure that if the author deposits one version to a particular repository and the publisher deposits another version that there isn't any kind of conflict uh, between the two that's going to happen. In other words, if, a, if an author is depositing uh, an author accepted manuscript uh, to uh, PubMed Central to be compliant with Plan S, but the publisher deposits the version of record to be compliant with the NIH rules, does anything uh, uh, break? The second uh, of the uh, top ranked options is deposit to an existing compliance server or repository. Publishers uh, here take on the burden to actually do the deposit. The previous option uh, essentially says the publisher sets the rules, uh, but uh, does not actually uh, take on uh, the burden to do the deposit. Publishers have been debating uh, whether they should take on the burden uh, as they would in this in this option. Some publishers think that given the downward pressure on APCs, uh, they really should not be taking on new burdens that will add new cost, especially in the early days where it's, it's likely that you're going to take on the burden of, of education uh, uh, as well as uh, workflow. There's the same decision uh, as before about whether to deposit the accepted manuscript uh, or the version of record. And considerations, uh, you know, uh, there's probably the same consideration that we had uh, early in the PubMed Central days, and it's whether to undertake this kind of deposit only for those articles where it's mandated, ex for example, Plan S articles, or do you treat all your original research the same? Uh, and uh, Highwire works with publishers who've decided uh, uh, differently on this question, so it's, it's still uh, open for debate. And under questions, uh, there's a new question here about whether repositories gain traffic from having versions that the publisher doesn't have on their journal site. Uh, so is it best uh, essentially for the publisher to take whatever they're going to deposit uh, and also make sure it's accessible uh, using the same rules on the journal site? Uh, and the, the, the answer to this might depend on whether Plan S gains significant new signatories or not. If it's, if it's three or four or five percent, uh, of your articles, you might decide this one way. If it's uh, 20 or 30 or 40 percent of your articles, you might decide another. Uh, and there's also uh, the concern about uh, getting correct funder information to drive the workflow. Uh, you know, the, the jury is still out on uh, how to best get authors uh, to indicate this or whether it's best just to have uh, copy editing figure it out. Now the third option uh, is perhaps uh, the most intriguing. It's a, a great example of new questions emerging as people think through the, the more obvious options. And what we found here is that there are several Highwire hosted publishers who are already operating in the spirit of immediate free access to author accepted manuscripts by posting them to their journal sites immediately uh, on acceptance. Some other publishers had considered this, but assumed that it would drive subscription decline, particularly if it was done uh, for all original research. Uh, but two of the publishers who've been doing this for 20 years were able to look at their data, and they believe there's no subscription decline attributable to this model. I go into this uh, a bit more in the, in the white paper. So the questions now, uh, are really whether this model will or won't be compliant. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, this needs to get sorted out uh, with Plan S details, and a number of questions in our feedback to Plan S are about this option. Uh, this, the, the concept uh, that the journals doing this have is that the journal is essentially its own repository uh, for uh, the green OA uh, author accepted manuscript. Now let's look at this, this uh, 
last, the fourth option, which is really not an implementation option uh, per se, but I've moved it up. Uh, uh, it moved up very strongly in the rankings. So I thought we should actually include it in the discussion. I think this is a response to the ambiguity people saw during the workshop as they dug into the guidance and listened to others' questions and comments. So for some publishers, this will be a temporary place uh, until there's, there's more clarification uh, coming from the implementation guidance. For others, it might persist for quite a while as they figure out their plans relative to the implementation guidance. So for example, uh, if, if I think that I'm going to flip my journals, maybe I don't want to do anything for now until I can uh, get the right plan in place. The questions here have to do with some very specific rules to see, that seem to be unclear in the guidance. Uh, uh, principles uh, lead you to believe one thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the guidance uh, is actually not as explicit as we would have thought. So for example, are hybrid journals off limits for Plan S APC funds, or are, is it off limits to publish uh, a a paper that has some Plan S funding in a hybrid journal, uh, assuming that it meets other kinds of, for example, it's got green OA, where it is one of the other options uh, that I've already described uh, operate. Uh, is, there a, is there an actual prohibition uh, on publishing uh, in a hybrid journal? Uh, or uh, is uh, it simply saying, uh, no, we Plan S will not uh, pay any APCs for that. The principle says hybrid is incompatible. That certainly suggests that you can't put uh, a Plan S article uh, in a hybrid journal at all, but the actual guidance doesn't seem to be that explicit about it. There are also questions, uh, and this came up over and over again, about multi-author situations. Can one author on a paper use non-Plan S funds to publish open access in a hybrid journal? And if that article goes on to a compliant repository, for example, PubMed Central, uh, is the article now compliant? And so we ask these kinds of questions uh, in our uh, feedback. Uh, another one that, that uh, people were trying to figure out uh, is if you stay the course for now, is, there, is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Uh, uh, that is, uh, are, is there an early or late adopter advantage or disadvantage uh, in uh, figuring this out early? So let's look at a few of the, uh, the, the topics that, that turned out to be questions. Let me get all the questions up here. Oop. There we go. It's perhaps almost too obvious, uh, so I didn't put it in the list of questions, uh, but, but the, the question that everyone wants to know, but no one does know, uh, is how far is Plan S going to proliferate? Uh, what's going to happen uh, in China? Uh, you know, Some people say, oh, uh, China has expressed support, but that's not the same as signing. Uh, what's going to happen in the US uh, in terms of major US funders? Uh, but also uh, in terms of, of government funding, uh, funders. Uh, and with that, uh, with that jury still out, it's uh, a number of publishers, I think, are actually sitting uh, on the fence saying we really can't decide yet. So let's uh, look at uh, the more substantive questions um, that came up in the, in the workshop beyond uh, the one about uh, uh, distribution of Plan S. Uh, the top three options uh, are really pretty similar uh, and suggest that publishers are leaning toward a particular uh, path. Uh, the middle path, deposit for the author or allow the deposit. Uh, this is something that people are familiar with uh, from PubMed Central. So maybe they say, OK, we, we get it. Uh, we have the workflow already in place, even though there's, there's no embargo. Um, Second, popular, that is what I've looked at is the, the three most, if you will, popular options, but that's not really the whole story. Uh, it, it turns out that 40% of the publishers uh, are considering, uh, of the publishers that were in our uh, group, are considering transformative agreements. Uh, they, they just look very hard to do, so they didn't put it at the very top of their, of their list. A third of them 
uh, are looking at but are not committed to flipping their journals uh, to OA. This again has to do with the, the concept of direction of travel. Uh, as a, a, the next uh, bullet about the, your views on direction of travel is critical in looking forward. If you believe that uh, this is the way things are going, I should just be planning uh, to get there properly, uh, then you might choose one set of options. Uh, but if you say, no, no, this is this is not working, this is not happening in my industry, my uh, my hybrid or non-hybrid is, uh, is good enough, uh, then you'd probably go a different way. Uh, we have some publishers uh, who have experience publishing uh, author accepted manuscripts uh, and, uh, and or uh, CC by licenses and they, uh, they see it as no big deal. So uh, they are, uh, I wouldn't say all of them, uh, in fact we just have a few uh, in each of these categories, but there is some evidence uh, that they have that it works for them. So uh, if you don't see these as a big deal, you might not uh, focus on, on other options. You might pick one of these. Uh, and then uh, the big big question is where do you believe uh, your value as a, as a journal or publisher really comes from? Uh, is it in, in the content itself? Is it in your commentary, your context, your selectivity, other services, uh, and so on? Uh, we also had questions about the role of individual funders. Uh, and uh, is it the funder who is going to uh, provide implementation details to authors? Uh, or is Plan S uh, going to do it? Right now, it looks like that's a, a funder role. Um, and uh, I mentioned already the question about multiple authors uh, and multiple funders and whether this provides any flexibility. Uh, there was a question about uh, publishers saying, hey, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll make one of these choices about implementation option, but we'll apply it only to Plan S articles uh, rather than to our entire uh, uh, original research output. And then I think there's a question of how much, what have we learned uh, from 20 years of PubMed Central experience? And do we really uh, know that uh, there are certain things that work well, uh, certain things that might be uh, complicated, uh, but only for the first 18 months uh, as things sort of shake out and authors uh, and uh, publishers get used to some something new. So those are the questions uh, that, that uh, we had. As I said, there were 27 questions we submitted uh, to the Plan S feedback. Uh, I uh, could not have assembled this information without uh, the people who participated uh, in the workshop. Uh, and I really want to thank uh, them uh, for uh, not only showing up at the workshop, but in, in uh, many of the cases speaking about uh, one of the options. Uh, so now we have uh, just a few minutes for uh, uh, questions, um, uh, just uh, two or three minutes. Uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, if we don't have time uh, to answer them uh, or if they simply don't have answers, uh, we'll uh, try and address the, this in uh, an email. Uh, so if you do have uh, questions, go ahead and put them into the go to control panel. Uh, and we'll try and uh, get to them uh, either today or at a later date. And uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, some of the questions um, we have. Oh, uh, so one of the questions uh, was about the, the feedback uh, that we submitted. Um, and I, obviously, I'm not going to go into 27 different uh, questions, uh, but I can tell you that the feedback uh, that we submitted had to do with, let's see, it looks like uh, six areas. Uh, compliance requirements and rules, uh, compliance monitoring and enforcement, transformative agreements, uh, which were, uh, they feel complicated uh, to the small and medium-sized publishers uh, that we work with. Uh, uh, they look at read and publish deals as something that works well for very large publishers, uh, but they're interested in the concept. They're just trying to uh, see how they would implement it. Uh, another major topic was APCs and will there actually be a cap? Uh, uh, there was a question about caps themselves. Uh, there were there are two philosophical questions. Uh, there's no other way to de describe them. Uh, one asking, uh, you know, essentially, uh, Really? Mirror journals won't work? Why is that? 
a uh, question about transparency um, and, and how to make your, your costs transparent. Uh, this seems very complicated uh, without some, some further guidance. Uh, and then uh, an other category, uh, in particular asking about uh, uh, what is the uh, OA conversion funding and help for academic societies and publishers uh, and nonprofit publishers that Coalition S is considering. Uh, because with help, uh, some publishers might consider other types of uh, options. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a question about transformative agreements. Uh, and uh, someone noticed, uh, somebody really sharp-eyed noticed that the <clears throat> in our uh, pre-workshop and post-workshop voting, there was a big drop in interest in read and publish agreements. Uh, why is that? Um, uh, I think there are two questions, two issues here uh, that came up. Uh, one uh, is uh, that these types of agreements, for example, the the Wiley deal agreement uh, that just uh, came out in uh, mid-January uh, seems to favor scales, scale, that is large publishers uh, who can aggregate over a large number of journals uh, might have a bigger, a better ability to deal with read and publish. So that was one of the issues that small and medium publishers saw. And the second uh, uh, is that it wasn't entirely clear how, uh, and this is, I would say, this is still unclear to me, how read and publish agreements essentially lead you to transformative agreements. Uh, it feels like you would need to have a number of them that uh, account for more than 50% of your articles before you would have uh, a transformative agreement uh, really feasible for a small and medium-sized publisher. So those two issues seem to be to be what was behind uh, the drop in interest uh, in read and publish uh, agreements. But as I say, there's still uh, a third uh, uh, to 40% of the publishers are still uh, somewhat interested uh, in understanding transformative agreements. Uh, so uh, we're out of time uh, now. Uh, there are, uh, it looks like about another dozen questions. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I will uh, be glad to try and answer those as best I can uh, without uh, uh, admitting too much that there are some that I don't know the answer to, uh, but I uh, will always be glad to get uh, input from others. Uh, so if, uh, if I uh, post uh, an answer uh, that's incomplete and you have a better answer, I would really love to, uh, to see uh, the, the answer from you uh, or just more advice and, and guidance. So thank you very much. Uh, for your, your time and attention. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll be glad for uh, feedback as well as uh, questions on this. Uh, SAC at highwire.org, if you have any feedback uh, specifically that isn't in the form of a question, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you again.